begin reading at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 6, and we'll get into our study tonight. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. The writer writes, Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And so as we begin, Jesus is continuing in this passage here in the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is continuing uh, being presented as having a superior ministry. Uh, Jesus is better, and you see that throughout the, uh, the book of Hebrews. He's better than uh, the prophets. He's better than the angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to Aaron. And being superior to Aaron uh, makes him a superior high priest. The ministry that Jesus has uh, is far better than the ministry that you find in the Old Testament uh, because it has a better covenant. It has a superior co uh, sanctuary and it has an offering that is effective. And so in the offering up of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that one time for all time offer is better than all of the uh, offerings that had been made under the Old Testament covenant. Now, as we've been looking at uh, Hebrews, when we were in chapter 5, the writer there in chapter 5 had given qualifications for the high priest. And you might remember that. He was taken from among men. He was appointed by God. He's a man, therefore he understood human weakness, and he also offered up sacrifices for both himself as well as the people. And so the point he's making here is because high priests were human beings, they were not perfect. But he has just made it very clear to us that Jesus is perfect. Now, he had stated that in chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, when he said, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus doesn't have to offer himself up a second time. Jesus came the first time and yielded himself up sacrificially on that cross one time for all time. So he doesn't have to offer many sacrifices because he's already offered up the one, the one sacrifice that is perfect. And so that's the point he's making as we enter into chapter 8 when he says this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We have a high priest who's perfect is the point he's making. We have a high priest. And notice with me, that Jesus' priesthood is being presented again as being superior because Jesus is serving in a place of honor. Jesus is serving not on the earth in the temple, but Jesus is serving, if you will, in heaven. He is seated, as, it, as we note here in verse 1, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, when you read in the Old as well as the New Testament, uh, something that refers to being at the right hand, the majority of the time that you read the term right hand is to present to us a position of power and authority. So Jesus is being presented here as being at the right hand of the throne. In another way, it's just another way of saying that Jesus is seated in a position of authority and power. You see that throughout the Bible. In, in Psalm 16, verse 11, for example, it says, "'You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Or Psalm 17, verse 7, show your marvelous loving kindness, O you who saves by your right hand those who put their trust in you from those who rise up against you. So it's a place of, of protection. It's a place of honor. It's a place of authority. 
Jesus is there at the right hand. That's what he says in verse 1 when it says he's seated at the right hand. And so Jesus is there in a place of power and authority. Now, he had prophesied as he was on earth that he would be seated at God's right hand, this place of honor, because he had said in Luke chapter 22, verse 69, hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And so Jesus had made it clear that his place and position was a place of authority at the right hand of his Father. So after his resurrection, Jesus has been seated in that position. The New Testament speaks of that constantly. In Romans 8, 34, Paul said, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Or in Colossians 3, 1, it says, If you are risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Or in 1 Peter 3, 22, which says, Jesus has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers are made subject to him. And so his point is that Jesus is superior. He's superior to the high priest. We have such a high priest, he says, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Now, he's writing this to encourage Hebrew believers not to feel that they're being left out. Jesus is ministering in an eternal sanctuary, the true tabernacle in heaven. And so the sanctuary looks at the priest's ministry in the presence of God. The true tabernacle reveals Jesus ministering in the actual dwelling place of God. So there he is, present for us before the throne of God. He says in verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. The function of the high priest is to offer sacrifice. He offers thank offerings and sacrifices for sin on behalf of people. So offering sacrifice is the essence of being a priest. For Jesus to be a valid priest, he has to have a sacrifice to offer. And that's what he did. In verse 27 of chapter 7, once again, he, he offered up himself. And so Jesus is presented as the one who made that uh, sacrifice and gave that offering. So he says in verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. He offered up himself. Verse 4, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Now, from a human standpoint, because Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, he was not qualified as being a high priest because he's not from the lineage of Aaron. Priests at the time of the writing were still making gifts and sacrifices to God. Well, the veil has been torn. Jesus is now in heaven. Even though the destruction of the temple has yet to occur, they still are continuing to give their offerings. But the point he's making is, in verse 5, that they serve. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, I want you to see this for a moment with me. A shadow has no substance in itself. It's just an evidence that something else is real. It's just an evidence that there's something else that is casting this shadow. So the point he's making is the Old Testament law, the Levitical system, was only a shadow. It was a reflection of the heavenly reality, but was not the reality itself. It was pointing to someone and pointing to something that was better. That's what we're looking at when we look at verse 6, and it speaks of a covenant that is better and promises that are better. It was pointing to something that was better. It's only a reflection of the heavenly reality, but something is coming that is better than that, and that is the fulfillment through Jesus Christ. If you take notes, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says, Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. In real the reality, however, is found in Christ. Don't let anybody judge you based on these things. I find that interesting because even to this day, we have people who will judge you based on shadows and not reality. We still have that to this day. I've had many conversations over the years with people who want to bring us back into and under the law of Moses. That happens quite often. I've had many, many conversations with people who, who have said, you know, um, Calvary Chapel ministry is really not a fully biblical ministry because you don't do things in a fully biblical way. And so you might ask, well, in what way are we failing? And what things are we not doing? And then you'll find people wanting to get you under the law. I remember a lady one time after a Bible study on a Sunday morning who approached me 
and said to me, this is the first time I've been here in this church. And I said, well, it's nice to have you as a visitor. And she said, well, thank you very much. She said, but the Holy Spirit has placed something on my heart that I need to tell you. And I said, is that right? Now, when somebody tells me the Holy Spirit has said something to them, I find it interesting because as far as I know, the Holy Spirit can speak to me too. So I find it interesting when somebody comes up and says, you know, the Spirit is telling me something you don't know. And so, but she may know something that I don't know, so let's hear it. So I said, oh, well, say on. And so she says, uh, the Lord is saying that, that he has blessed you uh, and your fellowship, but wants to bless you more. And I said, well, I'm always open to that. And she said, well, the way that that's going to happen is when you begin to meet on Saturdays rather than Sunday. And I smiled at her and I said, oh, that's not the Lord, that's you. But, you know, because you know, that's not what the Scripture has to say. The Scripture doesn't teach that. And I mean, a lot of times people will, will argue over points like that. They want to bring you under the law. They'll say, well, didn't God give us the Sabbath and shouldn't we be meeting on the Sabbath? And why do you break the Sabbath? I mean, there are... There are some organizations that will make a very strong case about that. You need to be on the Sabbath. I remember as I was in the military, I was going through the chow line, and as I was going through the chow line, there was a guy in front of me, and he was serving the chow and all, and I could hear him speaking to people, and, and the people who were receiving the food, uh, when he spoke to them, all had this shocked look in their face, and I thought, I wonder what he's saying. And I was only a few people away, and so I began to listen in, and what he was saying is this. He was serving them pork chops. And he would drop the uh, pork chop on their plate, and he'd say, if you eat that, you're going to hell. Well, it may kill you. I mean, army food is not the best in the world, but I don't think it's going to send you straight to hell, you know. But he said, if you eat that, you're going to go to hell. If you eat that, you're going to go to hell. And he kept saying that to every person, and every person would look at him and walk. So he, he dropped it on my plate. He said, if you eat that, you're going to go to hell. So I stood there for a minute, and I said, you got to tell me why. Why am I going to go to hell? if I eat this pork chop. And he says, because the Bible says you're not to eat pork. Now, I was a new Christian, you know, and I thought, well, does the Word of God say that or not? You see, there are people who want to bring you under the law once again, which was a shadow and not the reality. They want to bring you under dietary law, or they want to bring you under ceremonial law, or you have to meet on the Sabbath, you can't eat pork. And so I asked him, I said, oh, really? Where does it say that? He said, well, it's in the Bible. And I was a new Christian, so I ate my pork chop, and because uh, I'm a rebellious kind of guy, and I thought, well, if I'm going to go to hell, I might as well have a good meal. So I, I, I went and ate, and then I went to my room, and I knew there was something wrong with what he was saying, and I began to look into the Bible. Is that true? And I discovered that it's not true. I discovered that Jesus said it's not what goes into the man that defiles the man, but that which comes out of man, this defiles the man. So it's a question of human nature. And, and I, I discovered also that Paul said it's not meat that commends a man unto God, because neither is a man better if he eats, and neither is he worse if he eats not. And so as I'm reading the Scriptures, I'm discovering that, um, that Jesus Christ is the reality, and the law was just a, a shadow. Jesus is the substance. And so Jesus is the only person who was ever able to say, which of you can convict me of sin, because he's the only one who never was convictable, if you will, of sin. He, he never did wrong. He fulfilled his Father's uh, commands and everything in a perfect sense. So the law would point to me, that my imperfection is going to keep me, and you'll see this in a minute, is going to keep me from being able to be fully satisfiable to God because of my flesh, because of what I do, because of my heart and my intents and the, the variety of things within me. But I discovered that there is one who is able to keep the law perfectly, and that's the point that the writer is making, and that one who was able to keep the law in every, in every point was Jesus himself. And Jesus is the one who was able to do that. Um, there have many, many conversations. I remember another, another uh, couple of young men who came to knock on my door one time and, and, um, and were speaking to me and, and asked me um, if I was a Christian, and I said, yes. And they said, well, we have a Bible study that we want to invite you to. And I said, and where is that Bible study? And they said, where they were coming from. I said, well, it's nice of you to invite me. They said, uh, uh, would you like to come? I said, when is your Bible study? They said, it's on Wednesday nights. I said, I already have a Bible study that I attend on Wednesday night. I didn't tell them who I was. I just said I had a Bible study that I attend. Oh, really? And, and uh, what Bible study is that? And I said, well, I go to, uh, uh, you know, Calvary Chapel. Ooh. They said, Calvary Chapel? And I said, yes, Calvary Chapel. Hmm. They looked at, it was really kind of a fun time, you know. They looked at each other and they go, and then he, one of the young men looks at me and says, isn't that the church that says that Jesus is supposed to come into your heart? 
do you know that the Bible nowhere says that Jesus is supposed to come into your heart? So we had an interesting time. They were just trying to find something to condemn. These are the same kids who were saying, unless you are water baptized, you can't go to heaven. Rules and regulations constantly being placed on people, a misunderstanding of the grace of God, and a misunderstanding of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done on our behalf. And so the point he's making very simply is that Moses and the tabernacle is simply a copy. It's a copy of that which is real. And, and a shadow has no substance because it's only an evidence of something that is real, and therefore the Levitical system is a reflection of the heavenly reality. And so he says that in verse uh, 5 again, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now, verse 6, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. He mediates a better covenant based on better promises. He has a more excellent ministry, a more excellent ministry than any Levitical priest because the covenant that he mediates is based on grace and not the law. The covenant that Jesus Christ mediates is one of grace. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, Paul asks the question, what then was the purpose of the law? And then he answers it. It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promises referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. And so the law was intended to bring, to us a, bring us to a place of recognizing our imperfection, our helplessness, our hopelessness, and our need for somebody who could save us. And so Jesus' covenant is better because of what is promised. What is promised is unconditional. It's grace. The law contained conditions that the Jews had to meet. Again, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. You have to keep the law perfectly. You cannot keep just a portion of it. And so if I want to be made right through my observation of the law, I have to keep it in every element. It says in Galatians 3.12 that the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. And so these are conditional promises. If you do these things, you shall live. And therefore, if you, if you trust in the law, you keep every commandment. And you can't. I wonder how many people in this room ever got to the place that I've been, especially before I got saved, just before I got saved, I, I, I got to the point where I was crying out and saying to God, I'm not going to make it. I cannot do this. I'm tired of the way that I'm living, and I need help. And I would try. I can still remember trying to break some of the habits I had. I actually got tired of the way that I was living. I, I got tired of it. And, and I got tired of hurting people. I got tired of hurting my parents. I got tired of being hurt. I, I can still remember I was in, um, up, in up north, I was in... Uh, just outside of Monterey, in a place called Pacific Grove. And I went there for a, for a concert. It was a, actually a two or three day festival that they used to have, the Monterey Pop Festival. And, and I can still remember as we drove up there, I dropped a magic mushroom and, and I was loaded for two or three days. And I can still remember as I was up there in this particular place that my friends were all going uh, out to the, uh, to the concert, and they said, you want to go? And I said, no, I'm just going to stay here and just, just, just hang around. And so they left, and I can, you know, without making it seem like it was good, I, I do remember just smoking pot and, and reading a book and listening to an album by the Moody Blues. I remember that very well. And after I did that, I was all by myself there, 19, about 19 years old. I remember just thinking... I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. I'm 19 years old. My life's going nowhere. Because you see, what had happened is I was walking through this festival and some people walked past me. I always will remember these people because it was a guy, a girl, and a, and a baby about three years old, a young a toddler about three. They were all wearing clothing that the, the young lady had obviously fashioned out of sheets. He had a shirt and pants that were obviously made out of white sheets. 
She had a dress that she'd made out of sheets, and uh, the child had long, stringy blonde hair and had a, a kind of like a, um, it looked like a gown of some sort. That I don't know if it was a little girl or a little boy because they wore that at that time. Both girls and boys would wear clothes like that. They walked past me, and I was loaded on, on uh, psilocybin. And I remember when they walked past me looking at them, and it hit me, that's going to be you someday. You're going to be with somebody. You're going to have a little kid. You're going to, you have no future. That's the route you're taking. And it was, it was one of those moments where I thought, I better do something about myself because I'm going down the tubes fast. I remember that. And so they wanted to go back that night, and I said, no, I'm going to stay here. And I was reading a book, listening to some music, smoking some pot, and I started to think. I was about 19 years old, and I started to think, is that what I want for my life? Is that where I want to end up? Do I want to have that, you know, making clothes out of sheets? So I started saying to my friends, I'm not going to get loaded, man. I've had it. I'm putting down. We used to call it putting down. I'm putting it down. And so I did for about two days. And then two days later, I'm smoking pot again. Because no matter how deeply I wanted to stop, I had no power to. I wanted to. I wanted to. I saw where I was going. But I just couldn't do it. I just didn't have the power in me to do it. And instead of getting better, I got worse. I weighed 175, 108, no, 183 pounds at that time. And within about um, 25 days, I went down to 143 pounds. I just stopped eating. And I just was drinking and smoking pot and dropping drugs. And that's all I was doing. And I was just losing weight and I was losing everything. As I got into that place, I got to the point where I was saying, God, if there is a God, you have got to help me. My problem was trying to help myself. My problem was I had a mentality that God only helps those who help themselves. And so I'm going to have to find some kind of thing to do that is going to help me to connect somehow with God, whether it be through through acid or whether it be through religion, whether it be through reading this holy book that this friend of mine had, whatever it's going to be, uh, that's how I'm going to connect. And so it, it was right around that time when the Spirit of the Lord began to move, and that's when I was invited to go and, uh, to a little place called Calvary Chapel. And that's when I went and sat amongst these people and started thinking, they have something I don't have. It was right around that time. All of those things were being woven together by the Lord. And, and so all of this that he's saying here is very technical, but it's very practical. It's very simply this. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the high priest in the Old Testament system who would daily offer sacrifices and then yearly make that sacrifice for the sin of the people on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement. Jesus is better no, he was not from the Levitical tribe and the lineage of Aaron. He's better because he's after the order of Melchizedek who predates him. And being from the order of Melchizedek, he is a, a priest that ministers forever. So Jesus' promises are better and his, his covenant is better because the Old Testament covenant requires sacrifices to be made daily on your behalf. Whereas Jesus, one time for all time, has made that single sacrifice and has given to us a covenant of grace. So we're not trusting in the law because if I trust in the law, I keep every command. And if I break it, that places me under the curse or God's condemnation because I cannot keep every law. In James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, uh, James writes, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And so by putting themselves under the law, they automatically put themselves under the wrath of God. And therefore, instead of blessing, they end up with condemnation. And so when he says in verse 6, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises, Jesus Christ brings us grace. Grace is unmerited favor. 
And that's why I and that's why you as a believer was able to say, God, be merciful unto me. I'm a sinner. I don't have the ability to do what I want to do. The will is with me. The ability to perform that which I desire is not. I want to do right. But I find that there's another law that is operating within me. The one who wants to do right ultimately does wrong. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to save me from this body of death? I mean, I understand that from crying out and saying, God, help me, a sinner. I need you. And then he says, I have already done so in that I've given to you Jesus Christ. And so the covenant of grace is better. And that's because God not only gives to us his word, which declares to us what is pleasing to him, he also gives us his Holy Spirit who enables us to keep his commands. Ezekiel again in chapter 36, verse 27, God's promise, I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. I will put my spirit within you and I will write my law, my statutes upon the tablet of your heart. And it's going to be something that you internally not only desire to do, you have the will, but you also will have the power to do because I'm going to give you that. Now that is absolutely great to know that the Lord has placed that within us. Isaiah 44, verse 3 says, I'll pour water on him who's thirsty, floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants, my blessing on your offspring. I'll pour water on the one who is thirsty. And that's why Jesus could stand up that last day, the great day of the feast, and can say, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. That's the grace that God gives to us. So when you cried out and said, God, be merciful to me, God was in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You know, as we were looking today in the book of uh, Ephesians, be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's God's Holy Spirit who resides within us, empowering us and giving us that ability to live for Him. That's why every morning when I wake up, I, I, I say, God, renew me today. Renew me in Your Spirit. I, I need to walk in the power of Your Spirit because if I don't have Your Spirit within me, my flesh is just at the door just waiting to take control of my life. You know, I have this war within, Lord, and if, if You don't fill me today with Your Holy Spirit, if you don't continue saturating me with your spirit, the draw of the, of the world is so incredible. It is so easy to be sucked into its vortex and to wake up one day wondering, how in the world did I get here? What led me to this? And so he has a better covenant. He has better promises because they're built on grace. Now he says in verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So he's pointing to the fact that God is stating to them, listen, if you read your Bibles, you're going to discover that God made a promise. A new covenant was promised to you. That's found in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. If you read your Old Testament, you would see that God has made a statement that he was going to make a covenant or an agreement with you. So if you read your Bible, you're going to discover God's promises and plans for you. On one occasion, Jesus was speaking to some people who were uh, debating him. And uh, as he was speaking to them, he said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are those which speak of me. You search the scriptures, the, the word search there in the original language, you ransack the scriptures. Because in them you think you have eternal life. But the problem is, is as you go through Scripture, you fail to see that Scripture is revealing me to you. You know, and so Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you read the Old Testament, you're seeing a picture that is being presented to you of the one who is to come. And so when he's here speaking and says, if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, 
uh, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. It's in the Word of God. And all you needed to do is read Jeremiah, and you would have discovered it, that God has made a promise to you. God said, I'm going to establish a covenant, and this is what he does. Now, God announced his intention to give them a new covenant in, in Jeremiah chapter 31, and the covenant that he's going to give is going to be with the house of Israel and Judah. And what he was promising there is that Israel would be a restored nation and have a new relationship to God. You see, the nation of Israel had been taken and had been, uh, the, the ten northern tribes had been taken in, uh, by the Assyrians. And as the Assyrians had taken the ten northern tribes, they had divided the ten northern tribes from the two southern tribes. So God was making a promise through Jeremiah that they would be reunited and that God would do a work through them. And so as he has spoken that, to remind them that God isn't through with the nation of Israel, he had made various promises to them. If you take notes, I'll give you four things, and this is really basic. I, I, was, going to, I was going to take you to Jeremiah, and so I will. I think I better. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah. You say, where is Jeremiah? He's with the Lord, but his book is in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll show you this really rapidly. I was... I was just going to give you four things from it. But I think I, I want to show you these things. Because these are promises. What he's doing here in Hebrews is he's relating to a covenant that God is making. As you turn to Jeremiah 31, let me read to you further on. Because he continues on in Hebrews 8 and he says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor none, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he, uh, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So he's actually quoting out of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, there are actually several more than I'm going to give you right now, but there are several uh, facets of the promise. Uh, one, if you were to look at Jeremiah 31, verses 1 through 3, you would see the context, and, and these promises that are being made will be accomplished when they are regathered in the nation of Israel. It says, at the same time, says the Lord... I will be the God of all the families of Israel. They shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when I went to give him rest. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And so this is talking about a regathering of the nation of Israel. A second thing is we know that this promise's total fulfillment will occur after the tribulation. How do we know that? Well, notice Jeremiah 31, verse 7. Thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief of the nations, Pro uh, proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. So we know that this takes place after the seven-year period called the tribulation. A third thing that he's speaking about is found in verse 16. All enemies shall be destroyed. Because in verse 16, the Scripture says, Refrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from tears. Your work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. And that gives to us the knowledge that their, their enemies are destroyed and they're being returned. And finally, in verses 17 and 18, the homeland is rebuilt. There is hope in your future, saith the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim mo bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I was chastised like an untrained bull. Restore me, and I will return, for you are the Lord my God. Just yesterday, we were speaking about how the Lord is already beginning that work in our day. I was speaking to somebody just yesterday about how that uh, when Marie and I have been in Israel, how we have encountered people from all over the world. And sometimes we Americans, if you want to turn on back to Hebrews uh, chapter 8, sometimes we Americans, and I think that you are more sophisticated than the generation I come from, um, 
you know, the, you younger ones are more sophisticated than, than, my, than, than I was because I had in my mind, if you were to say to me um, the word Jewish, I had a stereotype as I was growing up. I, I didn't know what a Jewish person looked like because I really didn't know if I knew any people who were Jewish. And so all I had were stereotypes that were handed to us as we were growing up. And, and so I, I didn't have a clue what does a Jewish person look like. And so, because um, I didn't know any to my knowledge, you know, I may have known one or two in my whole lifetime, and I never really noticed that until we went to Israel. And there we are on a bus, and as we're on the bus, the bus driver begins to speak and sees Marie and speaks to her in Spanish. And so I discovered this man here is a Spanish Jew. And then my guide, it turns out my guide is from Argentina. His wife is from Brazil. Then we begin to meet other people from all over the world, from Ethiopia and from Russia. And before you know it, you see that there are Japanese who are Jewish, and you find Chinese who are Jewish. And, and after a while, you begin to blow your mind at the variety of people who have Jewish heritage. And so Marie and I were talking about this just yesterday. Uh, we were in uh, Megiddo, and we went into a, one of the shops there. And as we were there in the shop, there was a shopkeeper, somebody standing behind the counter there. And Marie and I walk up to him, and, and we begin to speak to him, and, and he has the Spanish accent. So, so I ask him, where are you from? And he says, I'm from Mexico City. I said, Mexico City? He goes, yes, I'm a Mexican Jew. I have met Jews from all over the world. And so sometimes you might be thinking stereotypically. You might be thinking that a Jewish person looks in a certain way, and they don't, because a Jewish person comes from all over the world, a variety of places, and all of that. And, and we're seeing that take place in our day. I mean, if you just for a moment realize that God's promises are true, I mean, there, is, there are no other people of the, the, the ancient people that you read in Scripture, you know, the, the various peoples, that the Jebusites and the Philistines and all of that, they have ceased to exist. But the Jewish people continue to this day to exist. They're God's miracle people. And it's absolutely true as you see that and, and, and you visit with them and get to know them and all of that. And so God said, look, I've got a work that I'm going to do. Now, you need to remember that during the 1800s and prior to that, prior to the uh, 1900s into the 20th century, 21st century, but prior to the 1900s, the 20th century, the uh, older commentators, when they would write concerning the nation of Israel, had what is called a replacement theology, a mentality that the church has replaced the promises God gave to Israel. But you don't find that in Scripture. You don't find God making a covenant with Gentile people. The covenant God gave was to the nation of Israel that includes us. We are actually grafted in. But they were not made specifically to us. We did not replace the nation of Israel. God still has plans for the nation. And so when he's speaking here concerning these final days and all, he says, I'm going to put my covenant within them. God is going to do a work, and he's already beginning because the nation of Israel in, in uh, you know, a short time has become an incredible nation. He's basically already begun to move in that direction. Unfortunately, the nation of Israel at this point is still blind and hasn't seen clearly Messiah Jesus Christ yet. That's part of the reason 2,000 years ago the writer of Hebrews is making it clear to the people there that God has a work he wants to do in them. And so again in verse 8, he said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't continue in my covenant and I disregarded them. They did not hold fast to the law of Moses, is the point he's making, because when he led them out of Egypt, that's when Moses gave them the law. For this is the covenant that I will make, verse 10, with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, all shall know all shall know me. This is going to be fulfilled literally in, in what is called the millennium or the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as he rules and reigns for a thousand years. Know the Lord. He shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. I like that phrase. Their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Um... My kids can tell you this is true. When they, even to this day, 
when they have done something that needs a father to deal with, and I can't find some other father and I have to do it, I'm one of these dads, and I don't know if you'd like me, that if you tell me the truth, I'll deal with you very swiftly and I think fairly, lovingly. But if you don't admit it, I won't let you go until you do. My daughter, Anna, has never received a spanking from me in her life. She says that I spanked her. She's lying. I never have. I lecture her. And she has told me many times, I would prefer a spanking over a lecture. I will keep her for two hours. You know, Dad, I'm tired. I say, so am I, but we're not through yet because you've got some things we've got to talk about. And that's how it's always been. If they admit that what they've done is wrong, I will tell them this. This is the truth. I will tell them this. I will say, it's done, it's over, and it's not getting brought up again. It's over. And that's the way it is. It's done. I'm not one of these guys that says, I remember when you did this six months ago, and I haven't forgotten. I may remember, I just don't bring it up. Because as far as I'm concerned, they apologized, it's under the blood, let's move on. Now, if I, being an evil father, am like that, which I am, how much more is my heavenly father like that towards me? God doesn't remind me of my sins. He doesn't bring them up. His sins, I will remember no more. It's not that God doesn't have the capacity to remember. It's that God doesn't bring them up because they are in the deepest portion of the sea, and we like to call it the sea of forgetfulness. It's gone. And for me, when he says to me, their sins, he said, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more, that's because they are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And those sins are now washed and cleansed, and we're purified, and that's how it takes place. God puts his law on the tablets of our hearts. He washes us with his blood, and we are completely forever forgiven by him. And by his grace, he doesn't recall them to us. He doesn't bring it up and say, do you remember? And could you imagine how precise he is and could be with you? He could tell you every single thing you've done from the moment that you were able to conceive of sin, but he doesn't. To me, that is an incredible reality. That is the blessedness of the new covenant, forgiveness of sin through the mercy of God. That's why Paul could say, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, because it is by grace that you have been saved. And so, in verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Because we are saved by grace and kept by grace, we walk in grace and serve in grace, it's all of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ, who has fulfilled all of the righteous requirements of the law, gives to us the ability to perform that which his Father has commanded and gives us the grace when we have failed to do all that we desire to do. He has given to us a better covenant and better promises.